Hello Smallholder Festival. Today we're going to be talking about how the rumen works. My name's Siobhan, I've got a croft outside Bewley with some sheep and cows and I'm joined today by my colleagues Kirsten and Karen. Here they are. Hi there, my name is Kirsten Williams. I'm a beef and sheep consultant with SEC Consulting. I also farm here in Aberdeenshire where we've got sheep, we've got beef and we've got turkeys. Hi, I'm Karen Stewart and I'm a ruminant nutritionist for SEC Consulting. I live in Angus with my husband and two children on our family farm. And today we hope to give you some food for thought. We're back in our offices now and ready to start on a description of how the rumen works. So the rumen, of course, is the most important thing to know about with your livestock. It's the hub of how everything works. And for all of us sheep and cattle and goat keepers, it's good to know what's good, what's bad, and how to keep your livestock healthy. So today we are going to cover how the rumen functions. We're going to cover different forages, how to tell what animals are telling you so that you can get it right. And at the end, the all important mineral supplementation. So now I'm going to hand over to Karen, who's going to explain to us just how the rumen works. OK, thank you, Siobhan. Um, so the stomachs of um, ruminants, there's four stomachs and the rumen is the largest of these stomachs. And basically what it is, is a large fermentation vessel where um, feed is broken down. And ruminants are quite um, unusual in that they are able to um, convert poor forages um, into energy and protein. Um, so it all starts with the mouth of the animal. They have got teeth on the bottom and a hard pad on the roof of their mouth for tearing um, forages such as grass or silage. And it goes down through the esophagus and into the reticulum. The reticulum and the rumen are sort of one of the same vessel. And this forage it goes down into this area and then it is regurgitated in the form of boluses. And this is why we often say chewing the cud or ruminating. And what this what this action does is the animal regurgitates the bolus of food and um, chews it probably about 60 times and then swallows it again. And then they'll do this about 50 times until the food is sufficiently broken down that the bugs in the rumen, it's, it, there's about 150 billion organisms in the rumen, which will break down um, this feed um, so they're able to get the nutrients out of it. So when you see an animal lying down in the field cudding, if you watch it, it'll cud about 60 times and then it'll swallow that bolus and then it'll regurgitate another one and um, uh, chew it again about 60 times. And that's called rumination. So the rumen is full of these bugs and the pH of the rumen is between 5.5 and 7. And that's where you want the pH to be to be healthy for all these bugs to survive and to break down all the food. Um, in cattle, there is about 150 litres of saliva produced a day, and in sheep, about 10 litres of saliva produced. And in the rumen, there's about 90, it's about 90% water. <clears throat> so the food gets broken down there, some gets absorbed into the bloodstream from there, and some goes into the abomasum for more chemical digestion. So there's physical digestion and chemical digestion. So the enzymes in the abomasum take undigested food, and the products of this digestion is absorbed in here and in the small intestine. So during a day, the rumen has rhythmical contractions and regurgitates these boluses of food um, to enable the um, food to be broken down. So in young animals at birth, they start off um, similar to a monogastric, so um, uh, you know, like pigs or um, our, ourselves, to be honest, with with uh, uh, one stomach, um, and the rumen is very, very small at this point. And what happens in suckling animals is there's an, um, what they call an esophageal groove, which is folds of skin that um, that open up. And so when the, the milk um, is suckled and goes down, it goes into the abomasum and gets digested there. It goes into a clot of milk and the products of digestion, the glucose is, is absorbed 
from that area. Um, and as the animal is gets older and starts eating um, you know, some bits of grass or it might eat some hard feed, the rumen develops and the rumen needs hard feed to develop and for all these bugs um, and the um, lining of the rumen, so all these little finger-like villi which absorb nutrients um, develop as the animal gets older and that probably happens about three um, to four months um, of age. So when they are young they're, they're, uh, they've not got much of a rumen and as they are older in adult cattle, over 70% of the area is, um, is a rumen. So keeping the rumen healthy, um, you have um, sort of three layers in the rumen. There's a gas layer, a solid material layer, which is the, the fibres um, from the forages that have been eaten um, to create a mat in the rumen. And this material could be in the rumen for up to 48 hours. And in the bottom, all the liquid and fine particles um, reside. Now, the rumen needs um, forage to create this mat. Um, and if you, if you didn't have long fibre, the rumen wouldn't have this healthy balance and it could fill up with too much gas um, that is unable to escape. Um, and this can cause issues. So long fibre is required and that's what ruminants do best is, um, is digesting long um, fibrous materials such as grass, silage or hay. And um, you want to avoid large meals, especially meals that are too starchy, like barley, which can be very fizzy in the rumen and can make the pH of the rumen drop very quickly and become more acidic. And this acid load in the rumen can change the, the bugs, which I'll come on to in a minute. And as I said earlier, the rumen is about 90% water, so you need a really good, clean, plentiful supply of water to keep everything flowing through. So keeping the rumen healthy really comes down to looking after these bugs, this environment, and making sure that they are happy and thriving. If you have sudden rash and changes, the, the bug populations um, haven't had time to change. So say if you're on a, a, a forage only diet, so grass only, these bugs are specific to um, digesting forage and they multiply and multiply and there's thousands and thousands of them digesting forage. If you suddenly change that diet to have no forage or low forage and lots of cereals or, or hard feed, these bugs can't cope with that. that, that's not what they are designed to do. So the populations need to build up um, to digesting um, concentrates. So if you do it very suddenly, then what happens is these um, cellulose digesting bugs die off and the rumen becomes very unwell because there's not any bugs to digest the feed that are going in. So ration changes need to be done gradually so the bug populations can, um, can change according to what is being fed. So this has to be a very gradual change, otherwise there's major upset in that rumen. And if the bugs um, are not in a healthy population, they can't actually digest the feed and they can't get the energy out of the feed for the animal. So that's when you see undigested feed coming through. Or um, if there's lack of a, a protein for these bugs, then um, they can't, can't digest the feed either. So they, they can be blockages. Things take a lot longer to go through. So it's providing a good balance of protein and energy and avoiding sudden changes. That's the main um, way to keep the rumen healthy. Now this looks quite a complicated diagram, but um, it's just to illustrate the protein in the rumen. So protein in the ration um, is entered into the mouth and part of this is just normal nitrogen, which is what the bugs thrive on. And they convert this nitrogen into ammonia and um, this the fermentable energy in the ration. So the energy and the protein um, go together to feed the rumen bugs and they need a good balance of this energy and protein. Now, excess ammonia in the rumen gets excreted and goes into the liver and gets recycled as saliva or it gets excreted out the back. And that's when it could be quite bad for the environment. If there's too much protein goes into the ration and there's a wastage of nitrogen coming out the back end um, into the environment. So once the um, rumen makes the, the, it breaks down um, the, the protein that goes in and the, the energy um, help the bugs thrive, you get what is called bacterial protein. So the bugs make um, microbial protein and that is the protein that the animal then needs. It's in a form that the animal requires um, and then it goes through and is digested. The products of this digestion are later on in the small intestine. 
some animals um, require extra protein. If, they, if they're under a lot of pressure, they cannot um, provide all of their um, uh, protein supply simply from microbial or bacterial protein and need what they call bypass protein. So use that are in late pregnancy um, uh, are, are an example of this, where they, they cannot make all their protein needs just from um, microbial protein. Thanks for that, Karen. I think um, just to kind of summarise what Karen was saying there, like the, the stomach and the rumen are hugely, hugely complex organs and it's managing what goes in them to make sure that they're effective. You know, keep the pH right and, and keep the bugs right in the rumen. So we're just thinking about what, what we're putting into that rumen. So um, grass is obviously the main part of the diet through the spring and summer months. And it's just looking at your grass, actually assessing it to see how good it is or how nutritious it is for the livestock. So we've got three pictures here. Uh, the one on the, the left to start off with is optimal quality. So it's, it's a lovely grass. You can see that it's, it's all lovely and green. There's clover there. There's a real kind of thick, dense sward. There's no grass kind of stems and it's, it's a really, really nice looking grass there. Over on the right hand side then, we've got a poorer quality. So you can see that your stems are, are yellow. So the yellow is dead, to be honest, and it's really, really poor. So when we look at the, the good stuff over on the left, that's high energy. And we look at the poor stuff over on the right, that's poor energy. So it's a really nice way of just really easily looking at your grass and seeing what like it is. You can then actually decide on which fields you graze which stock on, which is something that we'll come on to later. Then through the winter, you're feeding conserved forages. So that's when you've got your, your grass has started to slow down in growth and you're feeding them either silage, haylage, hay or straw. So your silage and your haylage is slightly different from hay and straw and that hay and straw is dried in the field before it's baled. It's then stored for the winter without needing any wrap or, or anything kind of additional. So we've got two pictures here. We've got the, the top one is a kind of poorly stored hay. So that is hay that's been made, probably been left out in the field for too long before it's stored in the barn for winter. So it's probably a good 15-20% of that bale is rotten, you know, it's all black on the outside, it's not going to be digestible, it's not going to be palatable, the stock aren't going to like it, and you've got possibilities that you might have mould in there as well, so you really don't want to feed that black hay to your livestock, so that would actually need to be um, thrown away. On the bottom we've got lovely looking hay, it looks good enough to eat from my point of view, so I'm sure it does for the animals as well, it's stored well, there's plenty of air getting around it. But when we start to talk about silage and haylage, that is slightly different in that it's, it's made and when it's baled, it's still wet. And we talk about it having dry matter. So if we say that a silage is 30% dry matter, that means that there's basically 70% water in that silage. And so that having that much water, if it's left out in the open, then it obviously will deteriorate. So that's wrapped or stored in a pit throughout the winter. And there's different dry matters. It depends how long it's sat before it's baled. It depends how, how the weather is, how, how um, the quality of the silage is. So this, you know, getting them actually analysed by a lab and knowing what is there is really, really essential. We've also, when we think about your, your silage and feeding it out through the winter, it's, it's happy when it's, when it's in its bag. So when it's either in its pit or when it's in its bale, it's, it's fermented, it's got a stable pH, a bit like the rumen, it's, it's got to, to be stable to be happy. As soon as that bale's opened, when it starts to be fed to the cattle or to the sheep, then it's obviously it's, it's changing its environment, so it's, it's making it a bit unstable. And the longer that it sits open, then the quicker it will deteriorate, basically. So I've got a bit of an example here, and that a 60 kilo yow, and a yow will eat about 1.8% of their live weight in dry matter. So that equates to 1.08 kilos of dry matter per day. 
If your bale weighs 500 kilos, and again, it's something that not every bale is 500 kilos, and if you can weigh them, then that's brilliant. And say we're talking about a 30% dry matter bale. So that gives us 150 kilos of dry matter. So if we divide 150 kilos of dry matter by how much dry matter the sheep is going to eat in a day, that gives us 138 eating days. So if you have got 138 yows in your field and there's one bale of silage, that will take them one day to eat. But if you've got less yows, it's obviously going to sit there for longer. So if you've got 50 sheep, that will last for two and a half days. If you've 20 sheep, it will last for seven days. So seven days is actually a really long time to have your bale sitting out because after three days it will deteriorate and you'll get a reduced intake. So it's not going to be as nice and juicy and palatable for the sheep to eat and they, they won't eat as much. So that's when you can, you know, if the rumen isn't getting as much intake, then that's when you can start to see any issues happening. And thinking about the different types of forages, so we've got good grass, bad grass, we've got different types of um, conserved forage as well. So think about the animals you've got and kind of prioritise animals. So here we've got animals that are all working, so they're maintaining themselves and they're milking their young. So they're actually your highest priority stock. They have got the most nutritional requirement, they need the most energy and the most protein. Then your next kind of class of stock would be your growing animals. So here we've got a growing heifer and some growing lambs. So if that's your replacement stock, you don't need a massive growth potential from these and they would be your next class of stock. Your final class of stock would be anything that's, that's not working as hard. So here we've got some cows that are in calf. So their calves are off them, they're not milking, and they're growing a calf inside of them, but they're quite early on in pregnancy. So they don't have as big a nutritional requirement as those working harder. So think about which, which grass fields, which particular stock are going into and which forages are getting. So today we're speaking about the role of the rumen and understanding it a bit better. So we've seen what it looks like inside from Karen's slides. And then it's thinking, you can't see inside your animals, so how can you look at your animals to understand if they've got good rumen health? And it tells you so much about the animal. It tells you initially just about their own physical health. You know, um, are they eating? Have they got an appetite? And being able to just kind of identify two key things from your animal lets you see just what is going on inside of them. So rumen fill is something that we can identify really easily. And you basically look at the left flank of the animal just behind the last rib and it's kind of identified here with an arrow and a circle on the cow and you can see there that that area is indented and that's that's if you think back to Karen's first slide I think it was and she had a picture of the rumen the rumen was up up the top of the four stomachs and that that is the, the biggest organ and the, the organ to fill and you can see from this animal here that that's actually dipped in in the flank there, which would indicate that it's maybe not as full as it could be. When we look at the sheep, we can see that they look really quite empty there, but you can also see that they've got quite a dirty backside as well, and that's another indicator. But your rumen fill, that has given you a really good idea of basically how much intake there's been, so your dry matter intake, the ration composition and its digestibility, and the rate of passage. So you're getting a really, really good eyesight of what's going on inside from outside. So we've got three pictures of dung and the, the one in the circle, the one in the middle there, that would be your, your perfect cow pat. It's nice and soft and it's maintaining its shape. That's really what we're looking for. And looking at the, the dung of the animal, you can start to get some signs. So the one on the top right, you can see that it's slightly different. It's almost like a mould. It's a bit firmer. And um, that shows actually that, that maybe the ration is a bit too low in protein or that it could be high in fibre. And it, it doesn't always need to be a bad thing. So if it's a straw-based diet, then that might be how the, the dung looks. 
We've got in the bottom right, and that's a really loose dung, and that can tell you numerous different things. It may be that they've just gone out to fresh pasture after being in the shed for the winter, and it's passing really, really quick through their system. Or it might mean that they're on a really wet forage, so it might be a wet silage that you're feeding them. Um, but it might also show that it's, it's something worse, like there might be some illness or something going on in there. So if you see some, some dungs that aren't, aren't as normal as you would see in that perfect pack, then it just ignites you being able to start to ask some questions. Obviously, sheep dung looks a little bit different from cow dung. And we've got over on the right hand side, that would be your, your perfect sheep dung for what you see when they're out on grass and, and they're eating a good forage diet. We've actually used the Bristol stool chart for humans here because I think it, it shows it quite nicely. And obviously type one in a human is not what you want, but type one in a sheep is, is good as long as it's soft and not hard. If it's a sheep that say is inside and it's on a concentrate diet like a finishing lamb, then you're not going to see that, that lovely kind of atypical what we see in the picture. You're probably seeing more like a, a two or a three. But as you go down the chart, and if you see your, your like your six, your seven, again, that's just think why why is it not normal? What else is going on in this animal? So using using those two really good visual signs of your dung and your rumen fill really lets you identify if everything is well within the animal. I'm going to hand back over to Karen to talk about the picture in front of us. Okay, another indicator that the rumen might not be functioning um, as it should be is undigested feed in the dung. And it's quite normal to see some grains in the dung if cattle are getting some hard feed, but uh, what you see in this picture is a lot of undigested forage um, or, or little like bits of forage that you can see there. So um, that could indicate that the rumen is not functioning as well as it should be. So um, the, the, the food is not being digested as it should be. So like so if it's in under too much acid conditions or there's not enough bugs there to digest the feed, it's coming through them in a way that it shouldn't be. So just something to look out for. But again, it's not uncommon to see a few grains in there. But if you were getting very loose dung or, or dung that looked a wee bit like this, I'd be starting thinking, that the room is not working quite as it should. And just finally, we just want to touch on minerals, vitamins and trace elements. Um, I wanted just to discuss about the three different methods of supplementing um, minerals, vitamins and trace elements. So you've got powdered minerals, buckets and blocks. Within powdered minerals, you get in-feed minerals, which are designed to be fed um, sprinkled on forage or within a, a, a mix of hard feed. Um, you get free access minerals which can be offered in a bucket um, at the side of a trough or in, a, in the field and the, the cattle help themselves. So the, the beauty about powdered minerals in feed is that they can be fed um, exactly what you need them to be fed that day, you know, their requirements. So for example, if a cow's needing 120 grams of a mineral, she gets 120 grams of a mineral in her feed. If it's free access, she might take less or she might take more, you've got less control over it. Um, with buckets and blocks, um, same sort of principle as um, free access feeds, the animals help themselves. Um, buckets are, um, as the word would suggest, in a plastic bucket and it's molasses base that um, sticks the minerals together and they lick that bucket. And blocks tend to have more of a feed value to them. So it's some, some feed, some molasses um, moulded into the shape of a block. And it usually comes in a packet that you then take the wrapper off and put into your own container. I would say that buckets and blocks, well, the buckets as well, you get mineral buckets and feed buckets. So some have the feed buckets have a, a feed value to them as well. And they are probably more designed if your forage um, is poor, poor availability. So see um, use coming up to lambing and you want to give them a bit more energy um, through a bucket, that's that's how you can do it that way. But again, your um, your access is free access, so you're not sure what the animals are taking in. However, the beauty about buckets and blocks is that they're very convenient, they're easy to do, and also they're pretty palatable. So if you are trying to get magnesium into suckler cows, for example, um, with a molasses base, they can take in a, a lot more, but they are more expensive than powdered minerals. Um, one thing I would say is that there are differences between the cattle and sheep minerals and what the requirements are. So if possible, um, if you have cattle and sheep together, try to offer your cattle their minerals separately to the sheep. So you can do this like in the picture to the right there by um, 
having a higher up trough and putting the cattle in mineral supplement or feeding into, into a high place where the sheep can't reach. And this is quite important because cattle, for example, um, need copper um, as a trace element, whereas sheep, some breeds of sheep in particular can be more sensitive to too much copper and you can end up with copper toxicity. Um, and for example, cows um, uh, really need a magnesium supplement every day. They don't store magnesium. And you might have heard of grass staggers where cows can become um, unwell or, or have an immediate death, to be honest, if they don't have magnesium. So particularly in the springtime um, when the grass is lush and in the autumn time when the weather um, deteriorates and they're under a bit of stress, if they don't have enough magnesium, um, you can get into problems. So it's really vital that they are supplemented with extra magnesium around about that time. So just um, when you are purchasing minerals, just take into account um, like the so sheep minerals could be safe for cattle, but cattle minerals might not be safe for sheep. So um, take, take these into consideration. And finally, I'm just going to finish with our five top tips. Um, our first tip um, is to keep the bugs in the rumen happy. The rumen is the main um, uh, the hub of the animal, and that's what will keep it healthy, and that's what it will keep um, it, it, it thriving. And, you know, using the energy and protein efficiently. So keep the bugs in the room and happy and everything else will fall into place nutritionally. Um, check the quality of your silage. So if you can get it analysed, there's a huge variation in qualities of forages, particularly as Kirsten described, dry matter. And also um, in terms of protein as well, we said straw was very poor for protein and silage is very good for protein. But also think about the animal stage of production. So are, is the animal lactating? Um, is the animal dry and just needing maintenance requirements? Or are you trying to grow the animal? So thinking about the animal stage of production and the feed that is required for that. But also, what is the animal telling you? So look at the animals. Are they healthy? Are they bright? Do they look alert? Is their rumen full? And is their dung consistency good? So looking at the animal and you know if it's got a good appetite as well, um, they'll tell you whether things are working as well. Um, and number five, if you use the FAS website, which Siobhan will give some more information on, um, it's a wealth of information and um, you can get a lot from that. The Farm Advisory Service has a wealth of advice. If you use the telephone number on the screen, you can get up to half an hour of free advice um, by phone or by email. If you want more bespoke advice, then a subscription is the best way to go and that is subsidised by the Scottish Government and gives you up to two hours of advice. And otherwise, if you go to the FAS website, there's a wealth of information there. Lots of practical guides, lots of links to podcasts. And if you go onto YouTube and search for the Farm Advisory Service, then there's a wealth of information there too on nutrition and all everything to do with crofting, small holding and farming. So thank you very much for listening to our, our webinar and we hope to see you again. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.